So first, the people over the years. Without the people, you can't really do anything. Early on my group, you can see the group is pretty small. I got some extra help. 2010, and the talk is mostly done by the people in these two photos, my current group. And of course, we cannot forget the mentors I had over my life, mentors at Cornell and at Bell Labs. These are really great scientists, my mentor, and eventually all my friends. So the brain challenge, we try to understand how the brain works. Some numbers about the brain, about one kilogram, not very heavy, about 1,000 cc, small, only 15 watts. If you think about this, this laptop I'm using is about 15 watts. So the brain is a light bulb, it's not very bright. <laughs> it has 100 billion neurons firing at one kilohertz, 1,000 times per second. It has one trillion cells and 100 trillion connections. If you look at those numbers, the brain is really like a universe itself. Right? If you think about trillions of stars and billions of galaxies. Now we're looking at awake and behaving animal to study brain function. We're not looking at a human because I don't have enough human volunteers to use my technology on, so I use animal models. So what we know, for a handful of neurons, we have a very good biophysical model of how they work. We also roughly know, I say approximately know, how humans and animals will behave. If I punch you in fa your face, you'll be very angry, for example. Predictable. But in between, you can see, we have a blind gap about 10 order of magnitude, 10 billion times. We don't know how to make this bridge happen. How to go from a few neurons, we know very well how they work, to explaining animal and human behavior. And to understand that, we need new tools to build this bridge. And that's where our work comes in. If you think about brain like a computer, it's easier to draw an analogy, right? Computers are made of transistor. Maybe 50 transistors make a circuit. Lots of circuit make into a chip. If you open the computer box, you will see lots of these modules make into a computer. It's a complex machine with billions of transistors. But on the other hand, there's no mystery. We know exactly how every piece works. So we design it. Right? We know how this works. We know how this works. We know how this works. It's a complicated machine, but there's absolutely no mystery. We know exactly how it's going to behave. You look at a human, look at animals, hear the situation. Again, when the neural numbers are small, we're very good at our physical models. And we can look at mouse running on a treadmill, human thinking something very complex, special relativities and all those things. But how do we go from here to there is a mystery. That's the black box we try to discern. And we need to build a bridge. At Cornell, we're good at building bridges, as you can see. <laughs> so why optical imaging, right? Of course, I do optics, that kind of makes sense. But why do we do optical imaging instead of something else? First is non-invasive. That means we can look at the living, breathing animals. You took a walk over here in the sun, you come here alive. That's very good because the sun is not killing you. It's non-invasive. And it's fast and can achieve high spatial resolution. We can look at dynamic biological function at the kilohertz speed. And we can look at the spatial resolution at a single neuron and single dendrite level. Quantitatively, it's about a one micron a little less, one micrometer a little less. But light cannot penetrate brain tissue. Now, that's very obvious. You look at me, I look at you. We don't see anything below the skin because light does not penetrate deep into tissue. If you can penetrate each other, it's probably not very, yeah, it's pretty ugly to look at, perhaps. Not good. But our mission is, I say three or four dots because it took us a long time to get back to this game because I took a giant detour in telecom for about seven years before I redefined my mission as making light go deeper into the brain. So I skipped all of those things. So the need for in vivo deep brain imaging is also very obvious. This is the mouse brain. A sagittal plane means you cut the brain like this, a sagittal plane. It's about one, uh, it's about, you know, one centimeter, one cubic centimeter in volume. One centimeter in length, maybe about eight millimeter in depth, right? Now, the best technology we have can look at perhaps 1% of the volume of the mouse brain. Remember, the human brain is about 1,000 times bigger, right? And that's also projected performance in a few years. Not currently, we're still working on it, but maybe in a few years, we can look at perhaps 1% of the mouse brain volume. If you think about that, 
It's really a no-brainer. Everyone wants deeper imaging, imaging wider areas, imaging much faster. There's no limit on this. You can imagine Mars with eight millimeter deep, we can only go about two millimeters. In many ways, our knowledge of the brain is very superficial because we cannot see very deep. If the brain is transparent, it's relatively easy. This is the favorite subject of neuroscientists, lava zebra fish. It's completely transparent. With something transparent, what you can do, you can bring your camera, you can take a shot, you get all the information you need. But as we also know, camera doesn't work in scattering brain. Think about dense fog. Unless you're very much in a romantic mood, you don't take photos in dense fog like what I took over here, right? You don't see much, right? So camera doesn't work when you have strong scattering. You can do experiment, my camera, cell phone camera, very good camera. You put a, a piece of Kleenex in the front, you take a shot, you see light reach your camera. There's no high spatial resolution information. You cannot really tell what this is. Well, that's just my office downstairs today. You can see the window correspond to this big blob of light. We can't really make out what this is, right? Because there's no high spatial resolution information. So scattering limits high resolution optical imaging. You can still see light, but you don't know what that is. Now think about the brain. Under camera, we just take a, put a cranial window, take a shot with a wide field camera. You really have to think about like a piece of tofu of cheese, depending from east or from the west. So it's really hard to imagine seeing a single cell below a couple millimeter thick of piece of tofu, a piece of cheese. And that's what we want to do. The best technology in town, really is in town, is really multi-photon microscopy. It's invented at Cornell in the basement of Clark by Winfred Denk and Will Webb in 1990. It is still the best game in town, in the world. So I introduced a little bit of the physics, graphically, so it's easy. This is a fluorescein molecule. It's a dye molecule. It's FDA approved, you can drink. You just turn green for a couple of days, but then you'll be fine. So normally what we do for this molecule is to shine blue light. The molecule gets excited and give you a green fluorescent photon. That's why the dye look green. So in the spectrum domain, this is your excitation wavelength in the blue and emission in the green. That's very conventional one photon excitation. So what Winfrey the Webb invented is a very simple thing is that instead of using one photon to do this molecular excitation, they combine the energy of two red photons, red photons longer in wavelength, lower energy. If you combine the energy of two photons, you can also do the same molecular excitation. So two photons in plus the molecule, go to the excited state molecule, then you get the same fluorescence coming out. That's the only difference. Now, what's important is that because two photons is needed to make one molecular transition, that means the fluorescent signal now goes nonlinearly with the excitation intensity. It goes as intensity squared. Okay, now this takes a little bit of time to, to, to argue through. But if you remember your high school chemistry called mass action law, that's literally what this is. What's important for this technique is two things. One is the fluorescence goes quadratically with the excitation intensity. And second, the excitation wavelength is much longer than before. Before it's blue in, green out. Now it's red in and green out. So remember those two things. There's a quiz coming up very soon. So what's special about this technique then, if you take a fluorescent cuvette, again, you can drink this, FDA approved. One photon excitation is blue light in. You can see the excitation profile. Here, the focal plane. But you can also see, addition, in addition to the focal plane, lots of fluorescence above and below. That's just a camera shot of the light going through my fluorescent cuvette. You do two photon excitation, magically, only the focus is bright, not much above, not much below. Now what happened? You have to imagine, because here, the signal goes as intensity squared. When you focus light, the highest intensity point is at the focus. If this is 10 times brighter than here, when you square that, this becomes 100 times brighter than the other. That makes sense, right? If this is 10, this is a one, they take a square that becomes 101. Of course, this becomes much more emphasized at the focus. So this is the photo, actually, my advisor Webb showed me where I was thinking about which group to join. And that's like 30 years ago. 
And I thought, that's so simple. I can definitely do this thesis. That sort of sets up my career until this point almost, right? So how do you do imaging then? If you have a sharp focus like this in the sample, you only have information from one point in space. But what we do is called laser scanning. We take the laser beam, we literally have two mirrors shake around like this. As you shake those mirrors, the laser point's gonna scan like this, a raster scan across the screen. Now, time is space, right? Because at every individual time, it's one point is bright. So record my signal as a function of time. That's how we do imaging, called laser scanning microscope. You build up your image one point at a time, okay? It seems you have a very sharp focus. This is a stock photo of Cornell when they invented this technology in 1990, black and white. I don't know why they did black and white at the time. Review you may know. So it's still the, one of the biggest patent Cornell had, from, at least from engineering, $20 million royalty. I actually got a small portion of this, long story. <laughs> but they won big prizes, Cavalier Prize, Brain Prize, I think maybe even bigger prize to come. And that was me, 1993, a beginning graduate student in Webb's lab. Now you know what pains me, right? You know, I wish I was three years older, so I'll be somewhere here, perhaps, right? So, to summarize, why this technology works so well in scattering tissue is because this nonlinear focus allows you to form a sharp focus in three dimensions, in X, Y, and Z. If you have a sharp focus like this, I can scan the point in X, Y, Z. I can image it as deep as I want, right? Because I have a point, I have a time, I just record space as time. So as long as you can form a sharp focus like this, you can image infinitely deep. You can image it through an entire elephant if you really want to. But what's the problem then? That's where we started to think about it in 2004. It turns out scattering decreases the number of excitation photons in the scattering tissue exponentially. Now this issue is, you can do mathematics, you can calculate, but I can explain to you pretty easily. Think about light gets focused with the lens deep into the brain, this, this is the brain, to a focus, right? You kind of have to think about a sniper shooting a person from very far away. Now here is one micron focus, one millimeter away. That's like shooting a person from 1,000 meters away. Same aspect ratio. If you think of watching American Sniper, you know. If your bullet hit anything in between, that bullet will be gone, right? Because you can't hit the target anymore. Think of brain imaging is identical. Your photons coming in, aiming at this very small focus of one micron. Now the brain scatters those photons, it scatters. Every time a photon encounters a scattering event, that photon can no longer reach such a small target. Just like a sniper shooting a person, if you hit something between, that, that bullet is not gonna hit the person. Same logic. Now mathematically, this means the amount of photons at the focus goes down exponentially as a function of imaging depth. That's the only physics I'm gonna go through. So there's only one equation in this talk, that's what this is. You can actually verify this ex experimentally. I look at a mouse brain vasculature, labeled with fluorescing, it's a bright fluorescent dye. I look at the fluorescent signal as a function of imaging depth. I do a semi-log plot, this is log, this is linear. In a semi-log plot, it's a straight line that means the signal goes down exponentially as a function of imaging depth. So this hand-waving argument and experimental results are very much consistent with each other. So the goal is, given this penalty of imaging deep, you can see as you go to a millimeter or so deep, you lose your signal by 100,000 times. It's deadly. Exponential function is really fatal in many ways. So how can we image deeper into the brain then? So that's where we start to think about 2004 and 2005. So ideation process, very simple. First you ask, what's the best technology to do? That's a two photon microscope. But why does it work so well? Well, that's a small quiz. Anybody remember? Two things. Nobody? Oh, I failed. <laughs> it's long wavelength, remember, and nonlinear excitation. You form a point with nonlinear excitation, it's long wavelength. That's the most important for this technology to do well. If you understand these are the best way to go deep, then how to go deeper is a no-brainer. What are you gonna do? Well, longer wavelength, is that obvious? And what else do you do? Well, three photon excitation. It's really that simple. It's simple, a bit crazy, but it really works. I say that because it takes literally one minute 
to come with this idea. I give a talk in the local high school and all those students say, yes, I know the idea. Boom, they came right out. If you spend one hour to think about this issue, you will say, crazy, it cannot work. This idea is not gonna work. It takes one day to think, but it might work. It would take about three years to really make it work. And that's the turning idea into things in applied physics. That's what we do. And we need a little quantitative analysis. You have to put the numbers into the situation. So I'll skip the numbers just to say, tissue scattering is reduced at long wavelength. This is actually something very obvious. If I turn on my cell phone to show you this, you, you instantly know. So, oops, where's my light? So you see the light? That's, that's what? That's white, right? If I put my finger through, what do you see? Red. What does that mean? So that means red light can go through my finger much better than blue, green, and orange light, isn't it? Because red light can go through my finger much better. What does that mean is that longer wavelength attenuates much less. So that's the obvious approach to do. And it's a simple physics. It's the same reason as why sky is blue and the sunset is red, okay? These are New York City, this is an Arabian Sea, so sunset. So quantitatively, let's look at the mouse brain. That's like the guiding principle we use. Light goes into the mouse brain, you encounter absorption and the scattering. That happens all the time. Absorption in the, in the brain, for in vivo, you have to have blood. You know, every mammal has blood, so that absorbs light. And water absorbs light. We are 80, 85% water, right? Even though we're smart. So this is the wavelength, this is the absorption coefficient. The lower the coefficient, the less the absorption. So here's the absorption spectrum of mouse brain. And if you go to longer wavelength, as you can see, this is the wavelength axis. The scattering of the brain reduces quite dramatically. So this is obvious again why sky is blue and sunset is red. So if you combine the absorption and the scattering event together because light encounter both phenomena at the same time, you can easily work out so we've got the effective attenuation coefficient. Again, the lower the coefficient, the lower the attenuation, the deeper light can go into the brain, and that was our mission. So you look at this graph, it's so obvious. The best wavelengths to use should be about 1300 nanometer and the 1700 nanometer. This tells you exactly that. And it turns out, before we start exploring the long wavelength, everybody was doing experiment in those wavelengths. Now obviously, if I change my wavelength, I can gain a factor of two or a factor of three in depth without doing anything else. It's that simple. Now it turns out this idea is really universal. I used to be in fiber optic telecom for seven years or so. You can see this is a loss in optical fiber. If you look at this curve versus that curve, there's a lot of similarity, isn't it? This is the water peak, this is the water peak. Because in the fiber in the beginning, there's also a lot of moisture getting to the fiber. So the optical fiber has a lot of water absorption there too. So you compromise scattering versus absorption, you end up at 1.55 microns. Everybody in telecom has that number etched in their brain because at 1.55 microns, that's what we do. Okay? So in that case, you can see in terms of physics, a spool of fiber in the brain is really identical. That means I spent more than five years in telecom, not completely wasted. When I switched my career, I thought, all right, all my expertise, gone. But no, the physics really connects. So now why three photon excitation? Well, two photon works well because one photon fluorescence excitation, not localized, two photon completely localized. Two photon give you a sharp 3D point where it focuses, right? Now let's pour some milk into this solution. This is transparent water solution, so you can look through it. What if I pour some milk through this? Make it scattering, right? You cannot look through a milk jar. And that's what happened. I hope you can see. Here's the focus. You can see these blob of light coming up on the top. In a scattering tissue sample, as you can see, two photon excitation is no longer localized. But if you imagine do a 3D scan of this intensity profile, most of the photons you're gonna get is coming from here. And you can see this is not sharp. You're gonna have a very blurry image. Now that's not good. You add a photon to three photon excitation, it's intensity cubic. As you can see, you recover a sharp focus in 3D. Same milky solution, no difference, just changing the excitation mode. If you're a point like this, once again, if you do 3D scan, you're gonna get a very co high contrast image, 
right? Because all the light is coming from this point, time, space, correlation. So in that regard, you can see we have no scattering. Two photon works perfectly. You put scattering into the equation, the advantage of three photon versus two photon is almost the same as two photon versus one photon. It's to recover a localized three-dimensional focus in a scattering tissue. So that's really what it is. So it's a natural combination. We want to use long wavelengths. If on the two photon excitation, you don't really have a lot of fluorophores to look at. Fluorophores typically in the visible. That means seeing the blue, green, orange, and red. That's the wavelength of fluorophores. You add a photon to it, you can use almost all your existing fluorophores. You can do blue-green fluorophores, green fluorescent protein, for example, Nobel Prize winning in 2007. These things can be very well excited at about 1300 nanometer, which is the good window we want to use. Orange and red fluorescent proteins, your three photon excitation will naturally land about 1700 nanometer, which is also the good penetration window we just talked about. So in that case, it's a very natural combination. So in that case, you can see you have two ideas. When you go to long wavelength to go deep, because the long wavelength reduces tissue attenuation. We also want to use three photon excitation to reform this sharp focus in 3D. But these two ideas really go hand in hand because the wavelength and practical 404 considerations. So in that case, you know, no matter how I want to spin this to see this is our genius foresight, but sometimes you're just lucky. It works, right? So now, many years to make it happen, we need to create new lasers, making microscopes, fluorescent proteins. We don't really do that. We work with others. We use the animal models. So that's how the experiment happens. So this really goes to the heart of applied engineering physics. We learn physics, do physics. We also do engineering. But the slogan really is we turn ideas into things. We're not just having an idea. We say, oh, the idea is great. We actually make it happen, turning ideas into things. Because only when you have things, you have real impact. And I love applied physics, of course. And sometimes you also get lucky with the biggest boss behind your back. In 2013, right, Obama announced the Brain Initiative at the White House. So the timing is exquisite. You know, we start doing this experiment about 2007, after five years. We now have Obama saying this. I thought it was appropriate uh, to have him here to announce the next great American project, and that's what we're calling the Brain Initiative. You know, as humans, we can identify galaxies light years away. We can study particles smaller than an atom, but we still haven't unlocked the mystery of the three pounds of matter that sits between our ears. And the Brain Initiative will change that by giving scientists the tools they need to get a dynamic picture of the brain in action and better understand how we think and how we learn and how we remember. So of course, with that, that comes, which is great, right? So, so in some sense, the ingredients to potentially do great work, if you think about this, the logic of thinking about it, is first define the problem. Here, you have the brain. What is the, my idea? My idea is the long wavelength three photon. What do you need to do to make it happen? That's the engineering. Make lasers and microscopes. Of course, time is an effort. You also need some resource, right? Without money, you couldn't do anything. And here, here the brain initiative come right in at the perfect time, and you need a bit of a luck. With all those ingredients, you can potentially do great work, not guaranteed. So now I'm going to show you just some movies. When those movies are first made, you can only see that at Cornell, but today there's about 100, 200 labs can also make similar movies. I see these movies, even George Lucas can't really make it. <laughs> right? So imaging through the entire mouse cortical column, you see this is the sagittal plane of mouse. We're imaging this little region over here, the 18 sections from top of the brain all the way down to the Y matter. That's the neocortex, neocortex region. You can see the neurons in these green donuts. Right? Every time they flash, it means they're actively firing action potential. They're active. So the fluorescent protein probes that it gets brighter when the neurons are active. So now for the first time, we now can image through the entire cortical column. So that's a breakthrough. But we also want to go deeper than that. This is the cortical column, the one that makes us smart. Now we also have the wide matter in between. I would say this is almost like cabling behind a computer rack. Connects different racks with these high-speed cables to communicate. And then underneath, 
this area is called hippocampus, very important region of the brain, was associated with maybe Alzheimer's formation, for example. It turns out this white matter region, we call it white, because it scatters light much more. To go through this, it's much harder. We can even quantify it, but that's what we do in physics. We always measure numbers. You can show that this little thickness of white matter is 2.5 times harder to image through than the gray matter on the top. So now we show you the first time in human history we can see neurons below the wire matter into the hippocampus, the three-dimensional reconstruction of the mouse brain in vivo. Again, these green donuts are neurons labeled by the G-camp. These purple are third harmonic generation of the, of the myelinated axons. So these are the cables sort of maintain long-distance communication in the brain. So this is a fly-through in the, in the brain. You can see from 500 microns all the way to about one millimeter. Purple, third harmonic generation blood vessels that myelinate the axons. These green donuts are neurons. And you can see, we now can see the hippocampal neurons in the in vivo, intact mouse brain. So these are the neurons flying by. But we can also watch them activity. Now you can see that's called watching mouse thinking very deeply, right? So you can see these neurons in the hippocampus they flash on and off, and every time it gets brighter, means they're active. They're doing something. They're thinking. So we can now watch mouse thinking very deeply. And before you want to see this layer of the brain, what you do before is that you can do, you can get rid of the brain tissue on the top, which people still do that today. You can still, they think there's no, no problem getting rid of that chunk of the brain. I'm not sure about that, but let's say it's no problem. You can also put a, a glass plug you displace the brain tissue with a piece of glass column. They can look through the glass to see what's underneath. That's also, people are doing this. But now we can do this without doing anything to the, super, to the superficial tissue of the brain. We can directly look at the brains underneath, right? And the spatial resolution, still very good, submicrometer spatial resolution. More than enough to see individual neurons. And we can also look at those activities very quantitatively. By looking at fluorescence as a function of time, right? This is fluorescence photon counts as a function of time. So we can watch mouse thinking not only deeply, but also very quantitatively. Or we can look at the fluorescence change as a function of time. We can ascertain these traces to see if you have a mouse brain action or you have some, say, photon noise, for example. So previously what I showed you is all with the cranial window. We remove the bone, put a piece of glass on the top to see into the brain. We can also go in through the entire unthinned intact moss skull. We still remove the skin and the hair. That's still tough to go through. But at least we can make, uh, make the bone intact and still see mouse brain activity through the piece of bone. And this is recording over about a week for the same group of neurons to see their activity through the intact skull. The mouse definitely will be happier with the skull intact, I think. And spatial resolution is still very good. You can see we can damage a neuron. We can look at the neuronal processes to look at their lateral and axial resolution, about one micron lateral, five micron axial spatial resolution. Still, more than enough to see individual neurons. Mouse neurons about five to 10 micron size. So now we can look through unthinned intact mouse skull. We talked about uh, zebrafish, the favorite subject of neuroscientists for a long time because it's transparent. You can look at lava zebrafish, you can use a camera, you can see the entire brain action. But what about adult zebrafish drawing to scale? Now we have to look through the, the cartilage, the scales, and see into the brain. And with this technique, you can see we can now see an intact 90-day-old zebrafish, almost from the top of its brain to the bottom of its brain. And it's completely intact. The, the fish is just glued on the stage. You can see that. So the green dots are the neurons imaging this little area called telecephalon of the zebrafish brain, going from the top of this all the way to the bottom of this. Okay, so the, for the first time, I think we open opportunities to follow the development process of a fish from a newborn all the way to grown up. See how the brain evolves over time. We also developed very recently a brand new laser system for imaging deep and fast. So I'm skipping the detail of how do we do that, we took a about four years to do this, but now we can not only image deep, for example, blood flow, deep into the hippocampus, about 1.1 millimeter deep, but also at the very high speed, about 60 hertz. We can now follow individual red blood cells, as you can see, flying through 
the capillary deep in the brain. You can see the shadows over here. That's a red blood cell flying through the capillary. Since the plasma of the blood is labeled with fluorescence, when red blood cell coming by, that become a dark shadow. It excludes the fluorescent labeling. So it takes about four years to turn this idea into things. So now the commercial infrastructure, if you want to do this today, it's actually getting very easy because there's at least six companies now making those lasers you can just buy. In the beginning, you can see before 2016, this is the laser we made ourselves. And this is really bad laser. If you have that, you don't want to use it. So lasers for laser jocks. 95% of the time, those lasers never work. For 5% of the time, you do all your thesis with. That's what you do. In 2016, I had a handshake agreement with Spectra Physics, a big laser maker. They say, I say, you make me a laser, I'll buy it. And they buy me a laser. It's not as good as the laser for fearless biologists. It's kind of 90% of the time it's working, but still 10, 15% maybe it's not working. 2022, another leap. And that's a robust one box solution. You just need to have the money to get the laser, okay? It's getting cheaper too over the time because a lot of companies competing for this technique. Long wavelength optics. Remember, we want to go to long wavelengths to go deep. That's what we want to do. In 2011, when we start to push that direction, we don't even have optics to do this. So I worked with Olympus to develop those new objective lenses. Each one of them cost me at the time a price of a Porsche. That's, Olympus told me that's half price only because they work with me, they were friends, so that's only a Porsche. Today you can get one for a Honda Civic, <laughs> much better. And at least I know at least 100 to 200 labs are doing this technology today. And it's really coming from going from cutting edge technology to become a routine technology everybody can use. And that's the impact for technology developers want to have, right? You want other people to use your technology, not just yourself. This is the best results I can find from others. Actually, they beat us now in terms of how deep they can go. This is the deepest vasculature imaging at about 2.2 millimeters in the mouse brain. So it's really quite deep. Sharp focus at about 1.4 millimeter in the hippocampus, you can still achieve a diffraction limited. That means it's the best optical resolution you can conceivably have in the brain. Imaging through the bone, imaging through the skull, you can see this one going through all the gray matter, the cortical column from top to the bottom with our technique. And this is the biggest number of cells I've seen recorded, hippocampal recording and the cortical column recording at the same time. These are all from other groups. And I know a lot of efforts are spending on with our technique to look at uh, non-human primates because the brain is bigger. You want to use, look for deeper. Uh, ferrets, I already see good results from that. Rats, bigger brain, tree shoes. So over time, hopefully all good results are coming up. Bigger brain require deeper imaging, obviously. So people have also taken the technology to miniaturize it. This is the first miniaturized three photon microscope. It's too heavy at the time. So what they did is that they put it on the rat head. A rat is much bigger, can carry 20 gram. A mouse can only carry two gram. Two years later, they miniaturized further to make it a hat for the mouse. So mouse can walk around and we can still look at what they're thinking. But in this case, you can see you tether the mouth with optical fiber at a wire. So the mouse can run around, have natural social behavior. We can still see the brain activity deep into the brain. So this microscope from Beijing just published this year, you can see weighs only about two gram, okay? If you look at the results we got with our tabletop microscope, you can see the similarity. I think they copied our color scheme. You can see the color label is identical, right? But the image is really getting very similar. So technology becomes much more adaptable to different con configurations. This, I would say, the first imaging system in the, in the field, really in the field. This in Transylvania, Romania, this summer I was there. So you can see it's, it's uh, in the basement of a pension, in the middle of nowhere. You can zoom in on satellite map. There's really nothing next to it. It's a microscope set up on a dining table, and it works really quite well. So this gives you people a lot of confidence. If, if the TA, if the graduate student can set it up within two or three weeks, getting good results on a dining table in the middle of nowhere, it probably can work in your lab also. So what's next then? Well, Cornell has any person, any study. By the way, this is the best college model by the Model Magazine. I don't know if you guys know about this, the Model Magazine. So of course, we can do anything, any study. 
right? So there's a lot of low hanging fruit. We're making a microscope. We're letting people to see things they can never see before. And that's very powerful. So what can we do? So a new postdoc, Quebec, came to my lab a few years ago, said, I can bring your technology into immune system. That's before COVID, by the way. So imaging mouse lymph node. You know, lymph node is like an interesting box. We know a lot of good immune things happen in the lymph node to defend you against infections and, in, and invasions. But how does it really happen? You want to see through the entire lymph node. For the mouse lymph node, for example, this is about a one millimeter diameter sphere. Typical one photon imaging, you can see, see very superficial. You cannot see through a lymph node at all. Normal two photon excitation may be the top two or 300 microns, a third of the lymph node. So he was saying, maybe I can use your technology to see through the entire lymph node to make it no longer black box. I can see exactly what's going on there. And long story short, it takes about three years to make that happen, but it happens. You can see that this imaging the lymph node very deep, about 600 microns deep into the lymph node. These are the immune cells. These are lymphatic vessels. We can see how the immune cells migrate in the, lymphatic, in, in the lymph node. Deep into the lymph node, you can see the red cells going in and out of this lymphatic vessel. So now we can track those immune interactions deep throughout the lymph node. He's also now taking into <coughs> our technology, look at the, so for example, the spleen. The spleen is very hard to image because if you look at the spleen, look at the liver, look at the kidney, they look red. What does that mean? That means there's a lot of blood content in those organs. And blood is very hard for light to go through. So you can look at a spleen, a sagittal plane. You can see that on the top of the spleen is all blood vessels. They look very red. A lot of interesting biology happens in those white regions called the white pulp region of the, of the spleen. Now to see through the red part, to go into the white part, it's very hard to do. So you take our technology to image a mouse spleen in vivo. You can see now, he reached about 400 microns in, which is just about over here, from here to there. Okay? Doesn't look very deep, it's only 400 microns, but we know we can consistently reach the interesting part of the white pulp. That's where biology, a lot of biologists want to do. And if you quantify this, you know that the spleen actually is about three to four times harder to image than the brain. So a 400 micron depth in the spleen is more like 1.6 millimeters in the brain. So it's a much harder thing to image through. So we are taking this, we haven't published this, but we're taking this to immunology and certainly with COVID, it's again very timely in some sense. So I'm closing my talk. So it's a long journey. You can see to take some ideas, very simple, one minute ideas to make it into a first demonstration, take about three years, and take really about a decade to make it into things. Because once you have the thing, you really can have a real impact in the world. And in many ways, a lot of people don't understand what is applied engineering physics, right? What the hell do we do? I think this is one example of applied engineering physics. We are physics by training, but we also do engineering to turn ideas into things. So acknowledgement, a lot of people helped us along the way from Cornell, uh, Cornell Weill, a lot of collaborators outside Cornell, but also many companies, either through luck or through necessity, work with us through the years. And fundings from mostly from NIH, but also got lucky with DARPA, IARPA, NSF, and thank Cornell for a lot of Cornell support. So thank you for your listening.